Let's pray. Lord Jesus, that day, the day we long for, that day we look forward to, when you will be vindicated, when every eye will see, when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow, when our own sin will be finally and completely eradicated, when we will worship you face to face, you will be our God and we will be your people and you will dwell with us and that will never end forever and ever and ever. Oh God, we long for that day. We know it is near. We pray that you would help us to anticipate well that moment, uh, to live faithfully before you. Even as we come under your word this morning, we pray that you would do your work in us, that you would use your word to transform us, to endear us to yourself, to Cause us to long for eternity and run from sin. We ask these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to be looking at God's Word in a moment. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we'd love to put one in your hands so you can follow along this morning. And if you don't own a Bible, feel free to keep the one that is being handed to you. If you do own a Bible, we want that one back. This morning, we have a unique privilege. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I just would remind us of one instruction Paul gave to Timothy, a pastor at Ephesus. Paul is giving him instructions about how the church should function. And he tells Timothy these words in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is a fundamental instruction for the discipleship of men in the church, for the development and discovery and equipping of faithful men who will then be able to take sound doctrine and teach others. If the Great Commission is to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, if the church is to grow and be built, it is to follow the Lord's directions for what the church must be. It must have qualified, capable men to shepherd the flock. And so the church's task is to disciple men. And as the church seeks to disciple men, there will be those whom God is leading and calling and bringing to pastoral ministry, to the character qualifications of what it means to be a shepherd in the church, to to the instruction that, it, that a man needs to be able to teach the truth and to refute error. You know that Grace Bible Church has been busy about discipling men, and, and we long to see God raise up men, godly men to lead homes, godly evangelists in workplaces and neighborhoods, and also along with that, some men who will go from here into full-time pastoral ministry. And the elders of Grace Bible Church has, have been about this business um, for a number of years. Uh, Josh Kelso was our first student at what we call Grace Bible Institute, a four-year seminary-level training designed for pastoral ministry, studying Greek and Hebrew and church history and uh, systematic theology and pastoral ministry and expository preaching. And we all benefit from Josh's shepherding ministry here at this church. Other men have participated in Grace Bible Institute from Matt Dodd and Zach Can and Jeremy Lehman to Tyler Azeltine. And currently there are two men who are about halfway through studying for full-time pastoral ministry, Jeff Maxwell and Omri Miles. And this is a ministry not just of the elders of Grace Bible Church, but it is a ministry of Grace Bible Church. And all of you as a body of believers participate in this ministry, whether you recognize it or not, and I, I pray as we uh, seek to give a little more visibility to this ministry that you will participate in even greater ways. I would ask that you pray that God would raise up men to lead the next generation of churches, uh, to raise up men not just in this church but all over the place to faithfully communicate God's word and to shepherd God's people. I would ask that you pray earnestly on behalf of Jeff and Omri, who sleep little, who work hard, 
who sacrifice much to train well. And I would ask that you pray for the elders as we seek to sharpen and expand uh, this ministry and pray for us in wisdom and how to go about doing that best. And this morning, it is my joy to invite Jeff Maxwell up to open God's word to preach for us. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Mid. Pray with me, please. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. I pray that my words would reflect your truth this morning. Lord, help us to be the kind of people who love your gospel, who love its advancement, who, in the midst of our plans, are rejoicing in its advancement. I pray most of all that you would be honored with what happens this morning. In Christ's name, amen. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Maybe you've heard that quote before. Maybe you know it from John Steinbeck's novel of mice and men, or maybe you've just heard it and have no idea where it comes from. It actually comes from an 18th century Scottish poem written by a man named Robert Burns. There was no great philosophical catalyst for him writing this poem. He's literally talking about the plans of mice and men. He's writing about an event when he was plowing the fields at his home, and he destroyed the house of a poor little mouse who'd been preparing for winter. He then compares the plight of mankind to the plight of this poor little mouse. Here are a few of his lines, a few lines from his poem in more modern English. He says, But little mouse, you are not alone in proving that foresight may be vain. The best laid plans of mice and men go often askew and leave us nothing but grief and pain instead of promised joy. This is a popular turn of phrase because it resonates with us. We can do all the planning in the world for a task, and yet the results can lead, as the author said, to grief and pain rather than the expected joy. Truly, our best laid plans often go askew or go poorly. But I want to show you that despite this author's conclusion, these plans gone askew need not lead to grief and pain. This morning, we're going to be studying an ancient church in Philippi who made great plans for the gospel. They made the right kind of plans for the right kind of reasons. This church, as I said, was in a very Roman city called Philippi. And in the first century AD, they received a letter from the Apostle Paul. And the letter is what we call the book of Philippians in our Bibles. We're going to read about where they were to find their joy when their good plans came crashing down. Uh, But before we get over to the book of Philippians, I actually want you to look with me at the book of Acts, uh, where we can find out a little bit more about this church. We need to do a little bit of history here. I won't reread the passage, but if you remember from the scripture reading this morning, Scott read from Acts chapter 16. The miraculous story of Paul's introduction to the Philippians. In Acts 16, we can learn a lot about Paul's relationship with the Philippian church. If you have the guest Bibles with you, that's on page 106, kind of toward the back half of the Bible. In Acts 16, page 106, toward the back of the Bible. Um, As you turn there, uh, I'm going to take a brief moment and explain a term that I'm going to be using repeatedly. Uh, I will literally say this word more than 100 times today, so if you don't get it, it'll be difficult for you. Uh, Some of you may be very familiar with this term, but I want to make sure we all understand it. It's the word gospel. The word gospel is a word that we use around here all the time. And it's a word that we, we use it here all the time because we find it all over the Bible. It literally means good news. The Bible teaches first that there is bad news. The bad news is that we were born sinners. We naturally disobey God and rebel against him. Part of what it even means to be a person for us in our world, is that we do things that displease God. We don't naturally obey him. And the Bible teaches that because of our disobedience, God's wrath is directed toward us. That's not good news. That's bad news. But the good news, what I will repeatedly refer to as the gospel, the gospel is that Jesus, who was both fully God and fully man, came to earth. 
He lived a perfect life, and he died on that cross. He was resurrected three days later and ascended to the right hand of the Father. What I don't want you to miss about his death, what many people do miss about his death, is his, that his death was not merely symbolic. His death on the cross accomplished something. In his death, he took on himself the full wrath of God that was aimed toward us. Those who repent and believe in Jesus have God's wrath turned away from them and put onto Jesus at the cross. We are shielded from the wrath of God in the death of Jesus. This is the gospel. So when I say that term, think of all of that. You can think about that Jesus came to die for those who would believe. Have that in mind as I use this term. The gospel, sometimes it gets confused. The gospel is not social justice. The gospel is not political or social revolution. The gospel isn't even about doing good deeds such as feeding the poor. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And with this good news comes a call to repent, turn to Jesus and submit to him in belief. So that's what I want you to think about when I say gospel this morning. With that understanding in mind, let's turn back over to Acts 16. If you've been here lately on Sundays, you know that Scott has been preaching through the book of Romans. Scott showed us in preaching through Romans that the book of Romans uh, was written, uh, it was a letter written to the Romans. Paul was writing it as sort of a stranger or an acquaintance at best. These weren't dear friends of his. Paul had never been to Rome at that time, and he didn't really know the people there. Uh, The book of Philippians couldn't be a whole lot more different than that. The most important thing I want you guys to know about Paul and the Philippian church is that Paul had an intimate relationship with the Philippian church. His relationship with this church was forged through their partnership in the gospel. When Paul first visited Philippi in Acts 16, he wasn't visiting a Christian stronghold. It wasn't even a Jewish stronghold. This was a very Roman city. There wasn't a Christian church And there wasn't a Jewish synagogue in the whole city. In Acts 16, we see at the beginning that Paul met some devout women praying together outside of the city. He cared for them by sharing the gospel. Some of these these women believed, including a woman named Lydia. The, The church probably met in her home. She graciously allowed them to meet there. After this small church was established, Paul and his friend Silas, this is what Paul read this morning, they were beaten and sent to prison for helping a slave girl. But then God did something miraculous. Again, as Scott read this morning, God brought an earthquake which broke Paul and Silas's bonds. But they didn't escape. They saw the jailer about to kill himself. They told him to stop. They shared the gospel with this man, this prison guard, and he became a part of this Philippian church. Eventually, they were released and asked to leave the city. Paul and Silas agreed to leave, but only after encouraging the Philippian church one more time, surely with the gospel. Elsewhere in Scripture, outside of Acts 16, we see that Paul and Silas visited the city a couple more times. Uh, They returned to check in on the church and to encourage them. The Philippian church saw the gospel advance to them and to others through Paul's gospel ministry. They loved what they saw, and they became a major supporter of his missionary work. They began supporting him and his causes financially. They prayed for him. They sent men to support him. Surely they had grand plans for his missionary work and and dreamed of the further advancement of the gospel just as, as it had been spread to them. He was their beloved missionary. But things don't always go according to plan, and we'll see in a moment that they didn't. Surely we know this. Surely the Philippians knew this. But it can be tough when our best laid plans go awry. So in the poet's terms, what do we do when our best laid plans go askew? What about our most important plans as a church? What about our plans for the advancement of the gospel? What do we do when they're unable to advance in the way that we plan? What do we do when we pour our prayers, our time, our finances into the spread of the gospel only to have our plans interrupted. Good plans to spread the good news through godly people. 
How do we respond when we've sent supporters to aid in a gospel mission, when we've trained men and women, our beloved real-life heroes, to translate God's word, to live among a foreign population with the express purpose of sharing the gospel? And our best laid plans are interrupted by technical troubles, by persecution, by lies, by illness. The world has answers, but they won't get you anywhere. Listen to the answer from the poet we read earlier. Here's his final judgment of what we should do when our plans go askew. Speaking to this mouse whose home was destroyed, who will surely die with the coming winter, he says to the mouse, still, you are blessed compared to me. The present only touches you, but oh, backward I cast my eye on prospects dreary, and forward, though I cannot see, I guess, and I fear. What he's saying, rather dramatically, is that the mouse who will soon die due to his destroyed habitat and coming winter has it easy. He's suggesting that our only option when our plans go askew is to look backwards at our dreary prospects in sadness and look forward in confusion and fear. Don't waste your time looking to obscure 18th century Scottish poets for answers. Um, don't waste your time looking to the world for answers to our problems. When things don't advance as we had planned. The world has no answers and no real solution to our trials. Um, as I've alluded to, uh, it, you probably are aware, if you've been at this church very long, you know that these trials aren't far from us. We have put incredible effort, significant finances, lengthy training, extensive character consideration into sending missionaries into the field, only to have them sidelined from our plans for the gospel. People who we love, unable to complete our best laid plans for the spread of the gospel. I want to be an encouragement to the church this morning, to our church, that the failure or change of our plans for the advancement of the gospel will not stop the gospel itself from advancing. The gospel will advance, even when our best laid plans for us do not, for it do not. Go ahead and turn back over to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, if you have one of our guest Bibles, that's on page 154. Page 154, Philippians 1. By the time he wrote this letter to the Philippians, remembering all that background, Paul was in prison again, this time in Rome. Knowing that Paul was stuck in this prison, the Philippian church sent a man to him to help him, a man named Epaphroditus. This man, Epaphroditus, was sent to help Paul in order to encourage him and aid him in his imprisonment. But Epaphroditus fell sick. And this man who was sent to help Paul almost died himself and became something of a burden to Paul. And so Paul graciously sent him back to the church in Philippi. This man was sent to him to help him. Paul sent him back to this beloved church of his with a letter in his hands. And that is the book of Philippians that we have right here. The Philippians knew Paul and they loved him. They loved the gospel. It was hard for them to see him sidelined from missionary work. Conversely, Paul loved the church he wanted to encourage them by telling them that the good news was advancing in spite of his circumstances. He wrote this letter in part to let them know that the gospel was advancing, even though his imprisonment might seem to suggest otherwise, even though their best laid plans for the gospel may not be proceeding, the gospel was still advancing. Paul knew that the best news that he could give the church was that the good news is advancing. The best news for the church is that the good news is advancing. Their missionary work may not have been going according to their design, but Paul reassured them that the gospel was advancing, even when their plans weren't. With all of that background established, read with me in Philippians chapter 1. We'll be in verses 12 through 8. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 8. Again, page 154. Uh, toward the back, if you have a guest Bible. Paul writes in Philippians 1, verses 12 through 8. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers 
having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. In verse 12, where we just read, Paul writes, What has happened to me? There's a lot in that statement, as we know. He's referring to his imprisonment. He wants the church to know that the gospel was advancing, even though he was in prison. He wanted them to know that he, this gospel-bringing, miracle-performing, missionary-traveling great apostle, could be stopped physically. But the gospel could not be stopped. The word really used in verse 12 carries with it the idea of believe it or not, or In spite of what you might think, this wasn't self-evident. Paul wanted to make sure that the Philippian believers knew that, believe it or not, the gospel was advancing even though he was in chains. And Paul's imprisonment was different than what we think of when we think of imprisonment. Uh, This wasn't a tent city type experience for him. This was not a general population type experience. In fact, we learned from the book of Acts that Paul was allowed to live in his own private quarters. Not entirely private. In Ephesians, he called himself an ambassador in chains. This is because while he wasn't a part of a general prison population, he wasn't in general uh, population, he was continually chained to a prison guard by an 18-inch chain, about this far apart from a prison guard at all times. life in chains, with no semblance of privacy. How would the gospel spread? There were perhaps dozens of guards being rotated in and out to stand by him, chained to him all the time. But Paul, in his God-given conviction, didn't see this as a hindrance to the gospel, but as an opportunity for the gospel. He knew that the gospel could advance through his gospel witness, For two years, these men were stuck with him. And they had come to understand that Paul was no common criminal. He wasn't chained to them for murder, for theft, for any common crime. Paul's imprisonment was for preaching the word of God. And these soldiers who were hearing the gospel were no ordinary soldiers. The the Philippians would have known this. The soldiers who guarded Paul were among about 10,000 Roman specialists. These special soldiers were called to serve for 12 years. After 12 years, these soldiers received the highest of Roman honors. These were the elite of Roman society. They retired in in riches. God worked out Paul's capture and his imprisonment in such a way that the elite guards of Roman society were becoming aware of the gospel. The gospel was advancing to some of the most unlikely of hearers. Physical barriers, the toughest of trials, were not an impediment in his preaching of the gospel. So Paul is then comforting his readers, his partners in the gospel, that even in the most discouraging of situations, among men who who could easily be called his opponents, the gospel was advancing. Do you think this was surprising to the church in Philippi? Do you think they were shocked? Let's think. Would they be surprised that the gospel was advancing to prison guards? Probably not. I can think of one member who probably wasn't shocked. Remember the Philippian jailer Scott read about earlier? He was a part of the body of Christ. He was a part of the church. Imagine the encouragement as a church to be able to look around the congregation and see evidence in their congregation that the gospel could spread in this way. Paul was reminding them that that things hadn't really changed. He was still sharing the gospel to men who guarded him. What an encouragement to the church. They never would have planned for this. 
but the gospel was advancing anyway through a faithful witness. Some implications for us. Life is hard. If it's not right now, it probably will be soon. Your life may not be 24-hour imprisonment with no privacy, constantly chained to a prison guard. Hard. But life can be difficult in many unexpected ways. Kids get sick. Cancer attacks us and our friends. Finances crumble. Physical pain, the, the death of a loved one, fatigue. All of these things can seem to get in the way of the advancement of the gospel. But I want to encourage you that in the midst of your hardship, you can remain faithful. The gospel can spread even when your life and your plans don't work out as you had hoped. Whatever you're dealing with, be like Paul. Testify of the goodness of Jesus through your trial. Let the gospel transcend your circumstances as it should so that the good news might spread through you. We saw first that when their plans for the gospel were not advancing, the gospel was advancing. First, we saw it through the gospel engagement of a witness. Second, the gospel was advancing through the gospel emboldening of believers. The gospel emboldening of believers. Believers were growing confident in God and preached without fear. Let's read verse 14 again. Most of the brothers, having become confident confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Because of Paul's imprisonment, because of this unexpected hitch in their plans, most of the believers were emboldened to preach the gospel. This implies that there was some fear among the church before Paul's imprisonment. Christianity, we know from history and from the Bible, uh, history in the Bible, Christianity had opponents everywhere. Paul himself had opponents all over the place. And many of the new believers seem to have been concerned about the implications of openly sharing their faith, the dangers. The Philippians knew this. Maybe the church even felt this fear themselves. But Paul wanted to encourage them that his example of suffering should serve to enhance their boldness in the gospel not increase their fear. Remember their relationship. Paul was their dear friend. And he was suffering terrible consequences for the preaching of the gospel. How it might have hurt the church to know that Paul was suffering these terrible consequences for doing exactly what they sent him to do. But Paul reminded them that this calls for boldness, not fear. This boldness arises in one who knows the truth, who knows that what Jesus offered is so much better than anything else. It is worth the most severe consequences to share this message. They saw Paul suffering, and they realized the importance of the message. Fear was overtaken by boldness and confidence in God. Let's live this way. Let's live in truth. Let's live without fear boldly proclaiming the good news of the gospel. If we understand God and his gospel message, we will, pro we will proclaim God's gospel without fear, with boldness. And if you're struggling with fear, I encourage you to be encouraged with Paul's words. Even when their plans for the gospel were not advancing, the gospel was advancing, first, through the gospel engagement of a witness, second, through the gospel emboldening of believers, and third, through the gospel exhortation of rivals. The gospel exhortation of rivals. Here Paul found some encouragement from a, a really strange place, it might seem. It's probably pretty easy for us to understand as we look at the text and think through the history how the gospel would spread to Paul's prison guards. It's maybe easy to see how the gospel would spread through Christians who were emboldened by his imprisonment. But here, Paul tells his Philippian friends about a way that the gospel is spreading that, that we wouldn't expect, perhaps. The gospel was spreading through men who weren't exactly friends of his. Let's read verses 15 through 18. 
Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul had a lot of detractors. Later in the book to the Philippians, he mentions some of his detractors, the Judaizers. You may be familiar with this group. Um, but here he's not writing about these Judaizers, these opponents of the gospel. Here he's talking about fellow supporters of the gospel, teachers of the gospel at least, who don't support him personally. The content of their gospel was a gospel by which men could be saved, even though the character of these men was deficient. These men were proclaiming that Jesus, the God-man, lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross for all who would believe. He took on himself the sins of believers so that the Father would see them as righteous. These men taught that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day and sits at the right hand of the Father. These men told people to repent and believe in Jesus alone. Paul says that these men preached Christ. But these men had little love for Paul. The words envy and rivalry in the text indicate men who were perhaps jealous of Paul. Maybe they thought of him as a rival teacher in some sense. They were competing with him for attention or money or fame or something. They were competing with him. A primary reason why they were teaching the good news was for self-promotion. These teachers thought that they could gain worldly fame and perhaps fortune by preaching. Paul even wrote that they wanted to afflict him in his imprisonment. This means that their motives were so bad that they didn't just want to advance themselves. Their motives were so bad that they wanted to hurt Paul with their ministry. These teachers wanted to use Paul's suffering and his imprisonment as a step stool to reach greater heights, comfortably stomping all over Paul in the process. These men considered Paul to be a rival Paul is writing to a group of people who loved him, the Philippians. They supported him in everything. And he's telling them that the gospel is advancing through men who see him as an opponent. These men likely had some disdain for the Philippian church as well, due to the church's supreme support of Paul's mission. But Paul is telling his readers that through these evil attitudes... And through these selfish men, the gospel was advancing. God's plan for Paul's imprisonment included raising up men who disliked Paul. And God had them preach the good news specifically to spite Paul. And through these men, the good news of Jesus Christ would be spread. This couldn't have been according to their plans. And you know what? Paul was okay with it. No. The Bible says in this, Paul rejoiced. He found joy because God's word was spreading. This, this doesn't mean that Paul was pleased that people hated him. It doesn't mean that he was pleased that he was being defamed. Paul isn't rejoicing that his name is being dragged through the mud. He isn't rejoicing that he's being stomped on by proclaimers of the gospel. But Paul valued the gospel so much so much that he, he didn't care nearly as much about the cruelty of these men as he did that their message was true in so much as they were teaching the gospel. As I read this, I was challenged in my thinking in, in a couple of ways. Um, you could probably guess that I am not important enough, skilled enough, well-known enough to have men who preach specifically to defame me or make me look bad. 
I'm not aware of anyone who thinks that they can reach greater heights in their ministry by stomping all over me. And you may not be in that situation either. But there are preachers of the true gospel who have impure motives. That hasn't changed. Are there men out there who are more popular than us, more popular than me, who preach true things from a selfish heart seeking fame? Well, yeah, certainly. Well, there are definitely aspects of these ministries that we should oppose. Do I praise God for the truth of the gospel that they preach? Do I rejoice in that Christ is preached in their ministries? What about men with a different theological bent than I have? Do I only focus on why they are wrong and how I can correct them? Or do I praise God that his truth is going out through them? If I am not rejoicing in that the gospel is proclaimed where it is proclaimed truly, then I am not following the example of Paul. Conversely, we don't want to be like these men. We don't want to be the kind of people who preach truth out of selfish ambition and pride. Don't preach the gospel out of some false sense that you can elevate yourself. Let's not preach simply to bring others down. And, and don't let it be said that the preaching of the gospel is the only thing worth rejoicing in in your life. So let's make sure we're not overlooking what is praiseworthy in the ministry of others, namely the preaching of the gospel. And let's not be the kind of people who are so character deficient that the preaching of the gospel is the only thing worth rejoicing in in our lives. Even when their plans for the gospel were not advancing, the gospel was advancing. We saw first through the gospel engagement of a witness, through the gospel emboldening of believers, through the gospel exhortation of rivals, and lastly, through the gospel exhortation of friends. Again, let's read verses 15 through 18 together. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Well, Paul did rejoice in the fact that men who hated him preached the gospel. This probably wasn't his favorite way for the gospel to spread. Nor was it probably a favorite of the Philippians who loved him. Paul wanted to remind the Philippian believers and encourage them that the gospel was advancing through people who preached the gospel out of love. These preachers of the gospel loved Paul, and they loved God. And they knew that Paul was put in prison for the very defense of the gospel. These men were the opposite of his aforementioned rivals. These were his comrades. These were his brothers in arms bringing about the truth of the gospel to the world. They were doing it in love. These men knew the content of the gospel, and they allowed it to change their outlook and change their behavior in preaching the gospel. This was a sweet encouragement from Paul to the church. This group that he's talking about here probably included many of the Philippian believers. Remember, they had strong affection for Paul, and they were fellow supporters of his gospel mission. Paul wanted them to know that there were teachers who loved and supported him who loved Paul's God. Paul rejoiced in the advancement of the gospel, and he wanted the Philippians to join him in his joy. Let's, let's mirror this group. Let's mirror their love in the spread of the gospel, recognizing the great love of God. And let's testify as a reflection of this love. We must preach the gospel in love. 
Paul was a godsend for the Philippians. Literally. They loved him, and he loved them too. He had established them in Christ, and they supported him in every way. For them to see him sidelined from his, his, his gospel mission that they had planned was a tragedy. This was a complete breakdown of their best laid plans for the gospel mission. They weren't expecting this. It wasn't supposed to happen this way. This isn't what they planned for or expected. But Paul wanted to encourage them in the, that in the midst of this terrible trial, the gospel was advancing, sometimes in the most unlikely of situations. And get this. The Philippians were so concerned with the advancement of the gospel that the advancement of the gospel was what encouraged them in the midst of difficulty. They loved the gospel so much that its advancement was exactly what encouraged them in the midst of difficulty. The spread of the gospel can only encourage you in the midst of difficulty if the spread of the gospel is what you really want. The spread of the gospel can only encourage us in the midst of difficulty if the spread of the gospel is what we really want. Paul knew that they were discouraged. And he knew what would and should encourage them to rejoice was the very thing that made him rejoice. The knowledge that the gospel was advancing. Let's be the kind of people who love the good news of Jesus Christ so much that news of its advancement causes us to rejoice. Let's be the kind of people who value the gospel so much that we encourage one, one another with its advancement. The gospel is valuable over and above anything else that we have. Its advancement is more important than mere earthly consequences. God is good, and God is sovereign. And his gospel, his good news, is going out through the world, even when our best laid plans for it go askew. And our best laid plans have gone askew. Um, our best laid plans as a church for the advancement of the gospel in Papua New Guinea, have gone askew. They've not gone as we have planned it. One of our beloved missionary fi families has been tragically sidelined from sharing the gospel in the way that we have planned. Our church made good plans for the spread of the good news through godly people. We love the dots. They are our missionaries and they are our heroes. We have poured time, prayer, incredible effort, training, money, and other resources into the advance of the gospel mission through them in Papua New Guinea. And as we might see it, our plans have gone terribly askew. It wasn't supposed to happen this way. But be encouraged that the gospel is advancing. Even though our specific plans for the gospel are not advancing, the gospel is. Some examples from that. Like Paul's prison guards, Matt's doctors, nurses, therapists, fellow patients, they're stuck with him can't get out. They know of his commitment to the gospel through Matt and through his family's gospel witness. The gospel is advancing. I can tell you that I have been encouraged and emboldened to share the gospel from Matt and Cameron's example, and I am merely one among many who have been encouraged in this way. Be encouraged. Rejoice. The gospel is advancing even when our best laid plans for it are not. In the midst of life's hardship and sorrow, the gospel is advancing through faithful witnesses who are sharing the gospel where they are. 
men and women are being emboldened to preach the gospel because they have been moved by the faithful witness of others. In the midst of our church's plans, selfish, self-promoting men and women who care more about the size of their congregations than the hearts that are changed are teaching the good news of the gospel. Through the testimony of faithful preachers who love the gospel and who love us, the gospel is advancing. Be encouraged by God's gospel and by its advancement. Let's, let's cherish the gospel and let's follow the example of Paul. Rejoice. Rejoice with me in the unstoppable advancement of the gospel. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. I thank you for changing me. Thank you for saving me. I thank you for the testimony in others in this body. We think specifically of Matt. We think of others who are suffering. Lord, we thank you for your truth that the gospel can advance through the toughest of situations. Lord, help us to be encouraged. Help us to rejoice in its advancement. Lord, make us people who love the gospel so much that news of its advancement encourages us through difficulty and trials. Lord, help us to grow in our love for you and our love for your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.